The following video was produced by World of Tanks, a game which involves, oddly enough, tanks. Plus other armoured vehicles with which you can enjoy driving around in and blowing up other vehicles. If you wish to give it a try and associate it with this video, go to worldoftanks.com slash chieftain. Greetings all, welcome back to Long Island, New York. I don't like New York City very much, but Long Island is fine because it is the home of the Museum of American Armor, as it says on the wall there. And this is where you will find Mr. David Levy's M25 tank transporter. So we had a look at the trailer and some of the outside of the M26A1 tractor in part one. And now I'm gonna ask Mr. Levy back to go over the components of the tractor itself. So without further ado, let's get to it. Okay, so we brought it out into the fresh spring New York air at a grand speed of, I don't know, three miles an hour. About that, yep. That was first gear in the auxiliary and first gear in the main. Correct. And you were, were you actually pushing down on the accelerator at all or mm. just idling forward? A little bit. It was, uh, yeah, got up to about 1500 RPM. All right, and the manual says to change it about 1800. Right, exactly. So. All right, so the tractor, this is an M26A1. It was originally designed by the Nucky truck company, which is a rather unfortunate name. Uh, the original was the M26, which was an armored cab, the A1 soft cab. And the difference in weight, you say, was about 10 ton. About 10 tons, 20,000 so pounds. 40, 42,000 yeah. for the armored version, subtract 10 ton, and that gives you this. Right. Well, I guess maybe we'll look at the data plate, we'll see. So markings on the vehicle, this is, is this what it had in service or is it just what, what kind of came with when you got it? So when I got it, this is what it came marked as. I'm not sure the, the pedigree behind that, but I kept it the same because um, it looked good. Fourth Armored Division, yep. Array, 126 Ordnance Maintenance, Maintenance Battalion. Battalion. Yep. All right. Uh, so soft skin vehicle, obviously, uh, with stowage right. for things. So we have our Pioneer tool on both sides. Oh, they're still very neatly, yeah. neatly stowed. Yeah. I'm used to these things, you just shove them in and they're just sitting there. <laughs> it's this way they don't fall out so easily either. All right. Uh, lifting art, lift here. Oh, right. uh, yep. presumably with these. All right, you have your blackout lights in here. Oh, hidden carefully. Yeah, little marker right. lights. The main service lights. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, big open grill mm -hmm. with stuff inside so we got a, a low vis light here it looks like right, yep we can actually flip this open you take oh. a look in there so you can kind of see inside oh okay so, so it's our blackout driving light mm -hmm. this is our siren with why red is light. It a red light do we have I'm any idea what's not, red? not sure why they need a red light on them but uh, they because it's on on the command car as well it was a red yeah, light right the almond yeah. version has this the m26 has the same light mounted up above the the service lights okay and a two-tone horn right loud um not not really that loud, right? So it's a uh, sounds like your typical air horn. And yeah. uh, so a uh, question back: We got a, a massive radiator. Looks like mm -hmm. air filters are here. Yep, the air cleaners are over here. Yep. Uh, so air comes up over the radiator, and then the air presumably uh, what's the airflow? Is it out from no? The it, front? it blows comes back in? in through here, okay. and it blows through the engine compartment, that big housing inside, mm -hmm. and then blows down the bottom gotcha. and back out. Yep. All right. What do so, we have on this side here? Yeah. So over here, this is in that box over there. That's the buzzer for the the low air. Um, low air buzzer. There's uh, the the governor regulators over there for when the um, to get the up the air pressure when it stops. And this is just the some of the wiring harnesses that go back through here and where the air manifolds go to distribute. The right, because the air manifold down below there. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So drop the grill. Of course, we got the the, right, the windshields. They do fold forward. Right, actually. they do fold forward, and you can see the locking mechanism in the middle there on the side that holds the windshield down once it folds forward. All right. So we come down, we get to the Wiffle tree. I kid you not, I had to Google it. It is actually a real word and what it, it is what is in the manual. And then we have the front winch, an 18-tonner. Yep, yep. So three, quarter, three quarter inch cable. 
And the manual says that's for if you get stuck trying to drag something out, mm -hmm. you drag yourself out with the winch. And it works. We've done that. You've done it. We've done it. Yeah, but it works. <laughs> where where yeah. did you get stuck? So we were at a reenactment and I took it around through a hill and the, the ground was really soft and a bit muddy from some rain and the trailer got bogged down and the wheels just started spinning on the tractor. So we brought the high speed tractor around, paid out the winch, connected the high speed tractor and actually the tracks on the high speed tractor were spinning in the mud too. <laughs> But between the two of them, we were able to pull up and out. So I got going again. <laughs> Just so, so, I mean, they really were thinking about this a lot when they yeah. designed this vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So actually, even under here, there's there's glad hands under here for service and emergency brakes. Oh, right. So if, if, we, if we had a problem with our air system, we could tie into another vehicle that could connect here and we could use the air for that vehicle. For example, even just the, the Diamond T Wrecker, we could connect their air supply to here and air up so we could be able to, uh, to drive and move. Well, nice thing about this, so we've got a lot of ground clearance here. So yep. you, you, get a, you get a pretty good view of the, uh, the steering system, the springs, big leaf springs. Oh, I see what you mean. So your steering wheel is up here mm -hmm. and the rod goes all the way back. Right. Yeah, so you can see the, the drag link across here. It's an enormous drag link going back there. And the, the whole power steering unit is up under the shield. So it's a big box with a big hydraulic cylinder up underneath. And oh, that's how yeah. it assists the steering. But the, the, the fill port for the hydraulic steering, I saw, is way the hell up, up and back. Yeah, right. It's, a, it's actually, and so you can get to it from in here. But it's, it's a big, enormous unit. So we had to let it down with, a, you know, essentially a big lift table, hydraulic lift table to get it down because it's so heavy. In the manual, they show you letting it down from above with a chain to, to with the chain wise bringing it back down. But there's no brakes on the front wheels. No brakes in the front. All the brakes are on the, the drive wheels in the back. All right, so come around the left side of the cab. First thing I noticed is that there's no side windows and there, there wasn't a canvas drop down or anything. It was just open air. No, there are. There are canvas covers that go on there. Yeah. And are they see-through or just? They're see-through. Actually, this one has a bunch of um, windows on it and the other one has a, a big window back over here. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so again, the big uh, 14 by 24, 20 ply. And I know, I, I didn't even know. I'm looking at the thread pattern to figure out are they, are they left and to tighten or loosen. And of course, they just put, look at the L on the bolt. Oh, well, that is uh, simple. Uh, but it is uh, no thing you see on a lot of older vehicles that, uh, that they saw. Any other one that changed? Not sure when it changed over, but the whole concept was um, the forward rotation of the wheel would loosen up if it was a right sided thread over here. All right, so canvas door. Yep. I wonder why they picked canvas. Oh, no, no matter. And a, a removable. Uh, Clamp. All right, so you have your vice and vice support. You can take it off and, and store it in the compartment over here if you like. Right, and all you do is you just lift it up yeah. and it unhooks off the bolts yep, there. Yep, it just slides yeah. off. Oh. Yep. Leave it on there for show. Yep. All right, and then we move back. All right, so now we come to the business end of the recovery vehicle or the recovery component. And obviously, first of all, we got the oxy settling tanks because uh, what's going to happen is uh, oftentimes if the vehicle is battle damaged, something is blocking the vehicle from rolling, like the track is screwed up. So it's just easier to cut the track with the oxy settling torch and hang it on. Right. Helium, a little odd. Yeah, it's uh, odd for this vehicle, but uh, it's a, a great place to store a tank and we have uh, helium balloons to go along with it. <laughs> so just and for going down to parades? For, for things like that, yeah, for events we have balloons and things. But uh, interestingly, the actual the tank, it's an original, um, the, the collar says U.S. Army Air Balloon Service, and the original date stamp on the tank is from April 1919. This was observation balloons, I'm presuming, or no, barrage balloons or I something. I guess whatever they needed it for, yeah, I'm assuming that's what it was. But, um, but yeah, and actually the, there's a date from, from July of 1944, and then, then I had it recertified and filled it up with helium, and now we can fill up our air balloons. But originally that would have been another oxygen tank for the, for the torch setup. So it's only if I forgot to ask for the front winch. So the manual states that the front winch is tied by gearing to the wheels of the tractor so that if you have it in first low and the winch engaged they work at the same speed so the front winch is purely connected physically by the to the engine and then its accelerator correct uh, it goes through um, I, honestly i'm not 100 sure how it's how it's connected and how it works i know that when when you put the transfer case um, you put the transfer case in neutral and then you go to the transmission you can you can rev it up that way uh, but the, the speed is controlled by the accelerator the speed's controlled by the accelerator exactly right, yeah. so that's for the front winch now we have two big winches at the back right. and six levers mm -hmm. this seems more complicated than i can remember from the manual can you remember it? um some of it yeah so the um so right now the, the winches aren't set up 
to work right now, but the concept is over here, this handle that's disconnected, that is the accelerator. So when you move that forward, it actually is a linkage directly on the carburetor that'll um, advance or retard the, the acceleration of the vehicle. So this is a power takeoff from the engine as well. It's not exactly. electrical or right. anything else like nope. that. Okay. It's all, it's, it's really chain driven. And when it goes down below to the, uh, to the power takeoff on the transmission. And then this is your clutch. So this, when you step on this, this depresses the clutch, um, just as if you're shifting gears inside. And then you have your, your shifting levers for your um, for forward reverse and then for the brake bands. You can see when you pull them that you can see a brake band around the drum All of right. the collar there. So you move the lever that puts the brakes on and off. And there's um, there's again, just like that synchro mesh concept. There's none here. And there's even a data plate that says caution shift levers fast and hold in to avoid the gear clash. So there's one cable and two winches. So you'd one you winch the one cable around both winches to get double the tractive effort. Is that how that works? There were two separate. There were two separate cables. Oh, okay. You just right. have the one in. Yep. Yeah. So the one of them, the other one's in the container in the back. All right. It's a good thick cable though. Seven eighth inch cable. Yeah. Uh, spotlight there to help you with your recovery at night and yep. to let everybody know what you're doing. Uh, two sledgehammers. Oh, I see we've got a chain on the far side as well. So the winches are, are yep. they reversed one side? Correct, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. All right, so you come back and you are astounded by looking at what appears to be a large motorcycle chain. Right, right. So this is, this is one of the highlights of the vehicle that makes it really unique, I think. Yeah. So you have a chain drive here that really is the power that comes from the transmission and the differential, and it goes into to two chains that, that drive the rear wheels. That's where really your, your power takeoff is. And I love the, uh, the stunningly complicated lubrication system for the chain. Right, exactly. So the way you keep that chain lubricated is you take your used engine oil, you put it in the reservoir up top, and then you set your valves just to let the oil drip onto your chain. And then just the, the dripping over time will lubricate your chain. I'm sure the EPA don't like that very much these days. It's pro probably not a, one of their favorites right now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there is good news. Just because this is a wheeled vehicle doesn't mean that there is no tensioning involved. For if you have chains, you must tension them. So how do you actually do it? So you can actually see, you can see the threaded linkages back deep in there in the right collar. There. Yep, you can right. tighten them up. And that's how you, you, you spread them. So you'd be pushing them, the wheels, axles back. To so the actual axles are going to be pushed mm -hmm. outwards. Right. So there's a story where the, one of the veterans who actually drove this vehicle, he had come here um, a couple of years ago was in his 90s, obviously. And he was telling us a story when he had an M26A1 like this coming on, up on Omaha Beach. He said that the, the ground is really soft and he almost threw a chain. So he started coming over between the wheels and grabbing the chain and saying, make sure your chain is tight enough because they get loose. And his story was this chain got loose and almost threw the track, uh, almost threw the chain off. Be embarrassing if your recovery vehicle needs recovery. Exactly. The, uh, the manual states that you're supposed to have about two inches of stack, if you're curious. All right, so while we're still talking about the powertrain, you have provided us for observation a bearing. And this is a bearing for one of these main wheels. Exactly right. So I have so, a leaking seal back here and I need to change out the seal. So I figured before I change out the seal, I got replacement bearings in case I run into problems. So where do you get a replacement bearing for a yeah, top like this? So you just gotta find stuff. They're uh, they're they're tough to get. They're not they're not made anymore. So you have to find either good serviceable ones that are takeouts or um find someone that has an old stock somewhere, but. I mean, you, you don't go to eBay and say, I want a bearing for an M26A1. I mean, well, <laughs> actually, believe it or not, eBay has some stuff like this. So, um, yeah. So, you know, you, you search for the Timken part number on there and uh, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, 941. And so, for comparison size, something like a, a Jeep or a deuce and a half would be yeah, how big. So you're talking one like that big. It yeah. fit <laughs> easily inside there, a bunch of you can get in there, so. All right, so we'll move on to the frame. So this is part of the A-frame system. Right, exactly, right. So when it's in this configuration, um, you know, you can you can tow a vehicle with this, but you also need the ability to, to pick it up and drag the front of it, just like a tow truck would be. So the way this system works is you have a beam like this on both sides, the telescoping beams. Um, they're they're pinned in the on the far end over there. That beam would lift up, and then this angle iron frame would lift up as lift well. The other way, okay. And then, if you when you unpin it here, that eye there would then go into that eye over there, and then how far you extend that telescoping beam would be the pitch the angle of the frame. Of the frame, okay. Right, and you can see over there there is a pulley up on top, and then you can take the cable from one of the winches, drape it over that pulley, and now you have a tow truck that can lift up 
vehicle. And then with the tow bar and the whiffle tree from the back, you can kind of, the, the tow bar and whiffle tree prevent the vehicle from slamming into the back of it. So you can hold it out rigidly and then lift up the front of it with the, the A-frame. And the fifth wheel is a mm -hmm. standard fifth wheel, nothing too unusual about that one. Nothing too unusual about it. Actually, when um, the um, when I originally had it, had to come here, my one of my concepts of moving the trailer would be, could I just have a normal tractor connect to this fifth wheel and just tow it here instead of putting on a flatbed? Yeah. But the um, the pin is different. Oh. So the fifth wheel pin so is it's, different. It's not a, do you think it's that not was standard. A, an industry standard of the time or is it just purely for... I'm not, I'm not sure what the standard is back then if it's changed, um, but at least this this was a mated set, but the fifth wheel won't is not compatible with the current tractor. So I've never actually bothered looking at the fifth wheel in any great detail before. So I, I noticed that it, it does actually, it makes sense. It swivels yeah. left and right yep. with springs. Exactly. And there's a very large handle at the top, which I presume is a release handle. Right, that's how you release it. So before I released it, I pulled that handle out mm -hmm. and then that handle released the, the, the kingpin in, in the center and it allowed it to slide off. And it goes the other way. So wh when you connect it back up again, it'll automatically kind of lock into place or right. do you have to physically close the handle to do that? No, nope, it'll lock into place. So when I come back, I have to come back with a little bit of momentum. I put the wood under the landing legs to give the trailer enough height so I don't have to lift it up so much. But the incline on the back here uh, and the front of the trailer the trailer will, will ride back up on here and you can see that yeah, you've got we've, like a, a complete foot almost that you yeah. can draw. Yeah. And it'll it'll slide right back up and click on there and, and you go with a little bit of you know a little bit of force just to make sure it locks in and hits in there. So I, I'll put the trailer brakes on, lock the trailer brakes on, and then I'll be able to back up right into it and that'll that'll pick up and then it'll close around the kingpin. All right, so now we come around to the back and it's a very impressive truck. I mean, you got the Caliber 50 twin spotlights, two inches. This thing means business. Fifth wheel, uh, a pintle for towing things that don't require the fifth wheel. Uh, looks like a connector, electrical cable. Yep, what, what electric, is this? Yeah. Electrics for the trailer. Again, we got uh, low vis light and service light. Uh, big long tubular axle. And I mean, I presume that just simply holds the wheels in place, doesn't mm -hmm. do anything else. Now, you were saying you've changed the brakes out. Right. Yeah, so originally back in the 40s when this was made, there was just air brakes. You had, if you had air, you could apply brakes. So the uh, air pressure took the place of hydraulic fluid? In um, the no, it's, it's all air. How, how so it's, it's, there's air canisters with a rubber diaphragm. Okay. You actually move these slack adjusters down, down below uh, and that'll apply just typical brake shoes. Okay. So when you had enough air built up and you step on the brake pedal, it pushes the air through the diaphragm in the can to move the slack adjuster and apply the brakes. What's the advantage of that over a traditional hydraulic fluid system? Um, it's just you know the volume of air that this is standard using uh, air air brakes. Okay. Yeah. So the um, the problem with that old system is you have brakes when you have air. If you don't have air, you have no brakes, and the the truck or vehicle can just can just roll without any air. So when I had my issue with running out of gas on the hill over there, I realized that actually this could be a potential safety issue with it without having brakes to, to lock the vehicle up if there's no air and the engine didn't run for some reason. So I, I made an adapter plate down here and basically unbolted the original can that was okay. on that, that was just an air brake alone. And then I put in um, current brake cylinders. So it's uh, just a complete retrofit where the bottom half of the can is a, a standard air brake, but the top half of the can is a spring brake. So in order for the vehicle to run with this configuration, um, you need air to, to take the spring brake off. So once the air bleeds off in the vehicle, the spring brakes apply and apply the brakes. So okay. the brakes are locked up. So you won't be able to move it unless you have air to take the spring brake off. So this is a reverse basically of what it originally was. Right. And well, we have four brakes on the back here mm -hmm. and four on the trailer. Correct, yep. Yep. Okay. And as we're moving around, but so hang on, I, th I thought there was a parking brake on the power shaft. There, there is. is, there is. There, there is There is a parking brake. All right, so that's how they would really do it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it, does, does, it doesn't brakes. hold very well because no. even, even adjusted, it doesn't hold well on, a, on an incline. So, duly noted if I ever have to park an M26. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there's not very many of these things that run, are there? Now, there's only a handful around. There's a couple Ahmed versions, but there's only two of the uh, unarmored versions that I know of. Hmm. So, the other ones are one in Holland? Yes. So, I've seen both M26A1s that exist. Cool. Uh, again, Big, huge chain, really, really very impressive. And uh, then we come around to the to the far side. 
So on the topic of things that you tend not to think about until you actually need to deal with them, while the camera was off and the crew were repositioning, we were having a nice long in-depth discussion about filling airs on tires. And I had never really considered the problems of filling air on the inside of a tire. And uh, so what we've kind of concluded is that this probably isn't right. Uh, because if you look at the wheel behind, this uh, pipe actually faces inwards, but they have a nice little hole here that you can reach through with a long extension and access the, uh, the filler pipe on the inside wheel. And because they point inwards on both sides, you can just flip the tire around. So it's, it's kind of, that's what I love about having a physical vehicle here because you, you, you see things that you just have to ask questions, figure out why it was done, and we come to an answer. So, uh, yeah, we, we have now learned that this is wrong and that is right. We think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so other things. On, this is an incredibly complicated vehicle. Big spare tire. Now, you had mentioned on the trailer that there was a socket for a crane jib or a hoist. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That would be this that you yep. have mounted here. That's a jib crane with chain hoist up there. So the chain hoist is on a trolley and you can see the lifting tongs that come down off of it. So those lifting tongs can go around the tire and it'll, it'll they, pinch they it right under here. Under here. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Exactly, when you lift up, it, it just applies more pressure on the tongue end and then you can support the weight of this as you unbolt it and then gently let it down. Um, this way you can roll it into place and do out your tire change. And behind we have, obviously we got the exhaust system. There's another whiffle tree and a towing bar. Right, so this is your long tow bar that would come with it. This is the one that you see on the Ahmed version that mounts on the front of the cab. Okay. Right out, right out in front. All right, so if we move back a little bit, I see a radio antenna. So yep. obviously this thing has a radio. Yep, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, have, how, many, how many countries would have, in World War II, the ability to put a radio on a truck? I mean, that, that just lets you know what the American industry was capable of. Yep. And more stowage here. So yeah, this is, a, this is fl uh, flare stowage that you'd have down here. And well, we're back to, we're back to the inside of the cab. Oh, yeah. I see more of those indicators again. Yep, yep. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's climb in and have more of a tour of the inside then. All right, so we've hopped up into the cab. Right hand side up front is the commander's seat. And again, they think about these things. He has a desk for all the paperwork that he gets to do as a, as a maintenance officer or a maintenance sergeant. And uh, he's got storage for the paperwork underneath. Hanging for the canteen, there's the uh, the master key, as we like to call it sometimes, for padlocks or other things that need breaking. Uh, a jerry can, but behind the commander in this uh, mechanic seat. Just behind this seat is stowage for one, two, three, four, five, six, looks like eight caliber 50 boxes. Uh, of course, the ring mount up top is directly on top of seat number seven. And then the engine is shielded by these panels here, which I've already undone one. Uh, I'll note there's a little louver here for the heating system. And it's not as if there's a heating pipe that comes in. All it does is it lets all the radiated air come out of the engine. And remember, it's under a little bit of pressure because of the radiator fan uh, dragging it back. And it just shoves it out that little vent in the side there. And it makes it nice and cozy and warm. Right hand side of the engine, you got your three oil filters. There's an oil cooler uh, radiator up front, exhaust behind the heat shield, starter motor down below, and uh, then the piping for the preheater for the carb. And uh, I'm told the other side is much more interesting, so I'll let David talk about that one. Okay, all right. So navigating through the left side of the engine, engine compartment here. So up in the front over here, we have the throttle um, and then the choke, and these are on a uh, regulated so you can lock them into place. Above this you have the horn. You have your data plate that tells you all your shifting levers and then positions that they're in to, you know, when they engage. Working our way back and um, we have our voltage regulator up top. Again you can see the other side of the oil cooler here. Um, our thermostats up on top. And down over here this is the air compressor. So this is the the heart of what gives the all the air brakes and the whole air system um, you know its air supply. Have our, our fuel filter down here below the original one in here, which wasn't a very efficient fuel filter the way it was made. So there's uh, your typical paper cartridge filter that now helps to filter out our fuel. Have our fuel pump. And then back in here is, um, is the distributor. So it's a very interesting distributor because there's two coils that go with it. 
And on the dashboard, we have the two ignition switches that activate the coils. So in the center of the, the distributor cap, you have your two primary coil wires that go in, and then there are 12 spark plug wires that come off of it because there's two spark plugs per cylinder, one on each side. So when you go from the distributor over here all the way around to the, the right number, number six cylinder, you have about six feet of spark plug wire to get over there. Um, working back over, we have our, our carburetor here. Um, this is our intake and exhaust manifold, uh, intake manifold over here with the heater that comes over from the exhaust manifold to preheat our gases. We have our generator down there that's, that comes off of an accessory drive. Um, so there's no belts, but has a flexible, what's called a rag joint um, between that and the accessory drive. Down below is the power steering pump and the power steering reservoir. And that's what gives us the power to work the hydraulic cylinder and the power steering, again, with an accessory drive off of the engine. And then we have our... Um, our tachometer and uh, speedometer linkages that come back from there to go up to the front. So uh, engine specs, the manufacturer okay. power, yeah. so on. So, so the engine actually, it's um, the engine is pretty enormous. Um, you can actually see up on top, it's actually the, the valve cover is embossed with Hall Scott. So this is a Hall Scott 440 engine. The, the valve cover itself is about four feet long. Um, the engine is 240 horsepower, six cylinder engine. Each piston has a five and three quarter inch diameter to it. So you have enormous pistons in like size of coffee cans. The engine weighs about 2,100 pounds. So when looking up um, specs on the engine, they only made about 1,700. I think it was 1,701 engines that Hall Scott made of the 440. And they made something like, you know, 1,300 and um, accounts vary between 1,327 and 1,372 engines. So there's only a couple of spares that were ever made for this vehicle. Um, how do you get it out if you have to change it? Yeah, so getting it out, you really have to take off the whole superstructure to get it out because um, it has to come straight up the top. And you have to take off all these covers, but then you have all the, 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 the piping system for the whole top. So all that has to come out. So the, really the, the cab on this is, is pretty much just unboltable and you can unbolt the whole soft skin cab and the sheet metal and the, the tubular frame and it lifts right off. Um, so even putting the armored cab on here would be a relatively simple swap between the two because they just unbolt the same way. Okay, so going through the, the driver's controls up here, um, so you can see your steering wheel. Actually, there's a logo on here from the Ross uh, Cam and Lever Steering Gear Company, um, which made the power steering. Below that, you have your, your trolley brakes that work the, the right and left brakes. So each hand would work either the right or left side independently. And the third one operates just the brakes for the, the trailer. And your instrument panel has your, your standard gauges on it. Um, you have the two fuel gauges there. The fuel tanks are in the back. Each tank holds 60 gallons. Actually, the, the operational range for the vehicle, they say, is 120 miles. So it's uh, really one gallon per mile in terms of your fuel efficiency. You have an ammeter. You have your um, temperature gauge for your uh, exhaust system. You have your temperature gauge for your engine. Your speedometer, your air pressure gauge, which obviously you need to know how much air pressure you have in order to be able to have your brakes. You have your tachometer, um, which has a tattletale on it. Uh, that red line tells you the max that your RPM has been. So every time the needle goes up, it pushes that red line up. Um, and so you can kind of see how far you've maxed out on because there's a, a definite warning on this engine for revving it too much or too high. Then you have your oil pressure gauge over here, and then you have your two ignition switches for both of your, your ignition coils, and then you have your starter button over here. So over here we have, um, we have the, the parking brake, which works off of a disc back on the drive shaft, and then you have your standard clutch pedal, your brake pedal, your gas pedal. Um, you have your auxiliary transmission over here, which is three gears. Your main transmission over here, which is four gears and reverse. You have your shift lever over here to put the front axle in and out of gear. And then right in front of the seat, which you can't see down over here, is your front winch control with different speeds to, to pay it out um, or pay it back in again. And then down over here, you have a, a shift lever for your fuel selector for each of the fuel tanks. And again, this is our, our heater system to direct just hot air that's blowing across the engine out to heat up the, engine, uh, heat up the passenger compartment in here. And then uh, this, this tunnel over here, this is where all our shift linkages go back to our transmission, which is right behind the engine. And we can take a look at that in a minute too. 
Okay, so we've come behind the engine and we've opened up the compartment, which is underneath, directly underneath the ring for the caliber 50. There's a small little seat here for crewman number seven and lifted up the cover, which uh, I note there's a lot of diamond plating on these things. So what am I looking at under here now? So originally in here, you can kind of see the remnants of um, what was uh, a perimeter lip here. You'd have a toolbox um, or storage compartment sitting in here. Um, once you take that out, you have access to the, the top of the transmission and the other components of the engine. So some of the things that you can see, you can see the, the exhaust pipe down over here. So it's quite a diameter exhaust pipe. A lot of exhaust gas is moving through there. This is the exhaust pipe for the carburetor preheater. So there's a pipe that comes from the exhaust manifold over the engine to the carburetor to heat up and the exhaust gas is exhausted out this way. So the back of the engine's right here. Here's our essentially bell housing and our clutch housing and flywheel, everything's right in here. Um, our starter motor we pointed out before is on the other side over here. Um, you have a, a power takeoff for the gauges up front and then your clutch shift linkage is down there. This is your transmission and all your transmission linkages come into this tower and that's how you do your shifting over here. And that's the drive shaft going back out. So you can see on the rails on both sides, more so on the, the driver's side, are all your hydraulic lines and your um, shift linkages and electric wiring that goes to the back of the vehicle. And this is the primary transmission? This is the primary transmission, correct. So the auxiliary is for the back? Yep. Gotcha. Now, uh, what, your left foot, you're standing on a fuel cap? Is that what you're yes. standing so, on? Yes. So under here, yep, you can see that the fuel tank is is under here. Um, you can see the other one a little There's bit better on the other side. side. So you have to fill them both independently? They're both independent, but it's um, it's uh, it's a big tank and it's when you put gas in it, it's like pouring, pouring do, do gas into a hole in the ground. Do you have to select one tank or the other or is it always drained from both? You can. I only have the one tank set up to work off of right now. But up front is a selector. You can choose which tank you, you draw from. Right. right. I think we're about done with the inside of the M26A1 Dragon Wagon. All right, great. Now the next thing we have to do is say, oh bugger, the truck is on fire and see how hard it is to get out. So should I need to rapidly egress from the vehicle? Not particularly difficult. I move forward. I open the swing door. Reverse out, taking care not to knock over the Thompson. In fact, I'll probably take the Thompson with me. Uh, or if I'm really in a hurry, I could, uh, not take the caliber 50 tripod and spare barrel. They have steps. I can even close the door. And I am safe. So that's it, they tore the M25 tank transporter, 40 ton. Didn't have uh, the longest service life because this isn't designed for transporting tanks over a long distance. It's purely a recovery vehicle, 28 miles an hour. And for transport, the older Diamond T would do fine. Built about 1,300 or so of the vehicles, slightly more of the armored cab version. Where did you say this one came from? This one was originally in Holland, and someone had brought it back to Wisconsin. I got it from the gentleman. The, the, no, this is Wisconsin. the same one I saw in Overloon then? No, the no, Overloon has another one. They have yes. it, so they both came from Holland? Yes, yes, the, the Overloon one is still there, and then this one is, is here now. And they were just given to the Dutch military maybe? Is that how it came out? Uh, I'm not sure, yeah. The, actually, the owner of this originally was Army Cars Holland, mm -hmm. and then his um, his son-in-law was Army Cars USA, ah. and that's who had it uh, back here in Wisconsin, and I bought it from him. Either way, yeah. it is a wonderful example of the vehicle. Very interesting, fascinating to go. I, as I said, I didn't realize just how complicated this truck was when I decided I was going to film it. Thank you very much for showing it to oh, my us. My pleasure. Again, it's in uh, Long Island. Uh, the Museum of American Armor. Just get on the Long Island Railroad, 40 odd minutes, give or take. And uh, you get to see this wonderful example for yourself. So that done, I hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one.